when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table, eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the dish with me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to the place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul was very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going out a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not that what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner from, for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man named Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scorched Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him inside the palace led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Matthew chapter 27 verses 32 through 54. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. 
they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were, cross were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he, des if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lava sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. John chapter 20. I'm struck with the followers of Jesus during this, this time. This is not a happy, sunny Easter morning. This this happened right after the, the trial, the crucifixion, and, and the burial of the lifeless body in the tomb. And the followers of Jesus, they're reeling in grief, they're confused, they're abandoned, they're hunted. And I'm sure some have feelings of maybe being deceived and being disillusioned. Starting in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, uh, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple whom had who had reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary, she stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in uh, Aramaic, uh, Rabboni, 
which means teacher. And Jesus said here, uh, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And, then he had, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, uh, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the hand his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. The account of the resurrection from which Reese read just a moment ago comes from a man who knew Jesus so very, very well. He was the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was a part of that inner circle even of apostles, along with uh, James and Peter. They were with him on occasions when others just didn't share the company with Jesus. He, he took them with him when he went into that room where a 12-year-old girl lay dead. And John saw him take that girl's hand and, and say to her, little girl, get up. And he saw the spirit and life return to that daughter, and she was restored to her mother and father. John was among those who, with those same other two men, fell asleep three times in the garden. As Jesus prayed in such agony, as he prayed so fervently to the father that that cup might pass from him, and then yielding his spirit to the Father's will and asking that his will be done even if it cost him pain, even if it cost him his life. And then he was with the Lord on that mountain when his appearance began to change. And according to Matthew's gospel, Jesus' face started to shine like the sun and his clothing became as white as light and suddenly Elijah was there and Moses was there and they were talking about what was going to transpire at Jerusalem very soon the departure of Jesus this was the disciple who had reclined with Jesus around that table in the upper room not many nights before and he was the one that being so emotionally close to Jesus and physically so close to Jesus had reclined upon him this was the apostle that stood near at the foot of the cross. Even though the shepherd had been struck and the sheep had scattered, John came near, along with Mary, Jesus' mother, and, and a few other women. And as he was in agony, rather than just thinking about himself, he thought about the woman who had given him birth in the flesh. He thought about his position as the oldest son in the family. He thought about the fact that his brothers at that point were still unbelieving. And turning to this one with whom he was so close, he said to his mother, Behold your son. And to John, he says, Regarding Mary, Behold your mother. And now late in his life, John looks back decades to the events that transpired at the place of the skull, the, the things that transpired 
in that tomb and at that tomb, in that garden near where Jesus had been crucified. It's not going to be long after writing the gospel that because of the testimony of Jesus Christ and because of the word of God, John is going to be exiled to a small island in the Aegean Sea, and there he's going to receive a revelation from this dear friend, from this ridden Lord and living Savior who is reigning at the right hand of God. In John, excuse me, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And as we are gathered today, worshiping in spirit and in truth, singing with the spirit, praying with the spirit, singing with the mind and praying with the mind, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was shining like the sun in full strength. He had seen Jesus' face shine like that before. At first he doesn't know who this is, now he knows who it is. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he laid his right hand on me saying, don't fear, fear not. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I die. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades because I was dead and live. You, though you have been dead, live still. The readings this past week have taken us through the events that led to the crucifixion of Jesus, culminating this morning with our readings and our focus, even within this worship assembly, on Jesus being raised by the power and the glory of, of the Father. And I hope that the readings over the past week have been beneficial to you, that they have helped you focus on the power of the cross and the glory of Jesus' resurrection, because this indeed is the heart of the gospel. This is at the core of our faith. And that's what Paul writes about in the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. As he reminded them, so he reminds us, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And I wanted those scriptures to speak this morning, and that's why I asked Justin and Nathan and, and Rob and, and Reese to share these extended readings with us and to read them for us. Much as we read a few of them on Friday night, I wanted the word of God to speak powerfully in testimony about God's son. And that's why this morning I had planned for my comments in relation to those readings to be rather brief. And upon hearing that, some of you are thinking, happy Easter indeed. <laughs> but I, thank you, Lee. But I thought the, the more I say about it, the less the impact of those words from scripture will remain with us. How essential <clears throat> is what we have heard read? How essential is that to our faith? Paul talks about that a little later in this same chapter. Verse 12, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. 
We were even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he didn't raise, if it is true that the dead aren't raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, and if in Christ we have hoped only in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. It is in that re resurrection that we live every single day, not just on Easter Sunday, not just when we focus on what God accomplished according to the promise of Scripture, according to Jesus' own words, that he would be handed over to his enemies, that he would be mistreated, that he would be spit upon, that he would be put to death, but then raised on the third day. That is so essential to, to what we believe, and it is in that faith in the resurrection that we live and our lives and our faith make absolutely no sense without it. We live in the resurrection because we live in Christ, and he said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Was it just last week that we had life groups? Was it just last week that we focused on, on John 11 two weeks ago? And Jesus delaying his journey to Bethany where he had heard his dear friend Lazarus was sick, his beloved friend with his two sisters that Jesus loved, Mary and Martha. By the time he ultimately gets there, coming back to Judea, Judea putting himself at risk and his disciples at risk, in the proximity of his enemies. Martha comes to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. We live in the resurrection because we live in Christ. We live in the resurrection because we died with him and were buried with him and were raised with him. According to Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk and live in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Alive in him, alive in the resurrection. Because like Cadence last Wednesday night, and it was so beautiful to see the kids up here last Sunday. And Cadence was among those who told us who she believed Jesus was and why he meant so much to her. And on Wednesday night, she told us that she believed that he was the son of God, that he had died to save her from sin. And we saw her reenact the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. We saw her die. We saw her buried. We rejoiced that she was raised. And her confession of Jesus was a verbalization of her faith. And the repentance that she committed herself to in her heart was an actualization of her faith. And then we saw a dramatization of her faith in the death, in the burial, in the resurrection of Jesus. We're dead to that. We are alive to Christ. We are alive in him. We live in the resurrection. 
and we serve as witnesses of the resurrection. We join Mary and the other women. We join Peter and John that ran to the tomb. We, ran, uh, we, we number ourselves with the 11, uh, first with the absence of Thomas, and then eight days later, the next Sunday, with, with Thomas. As you were reading, maybe in your Bible class, maybe in what I had emailed out uh, this morning, maybe in your own readings, maybe with what Reese read for us, maybe it was because it was dark that Mary didn't write, recognize Jesus, but the text says that she saw him standing and didn't recognize him. I think that's why she didn't recognize him. He's not supposed to be standing. Three times in that chapter, the question is asked, you know, or, or the statement is made, the body is gone and we don't know where they have laid him. They're still expecting a corpse. She's not expecting to see him on his feet. And yet she becomes a witness of the resurrection. Paul, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, mentions a special appearance to Peter and to the 11 and to more than 500 people at one time and then separately to James, probably his, his half-brother, James, then to all the apostles. And then Paul says, like to one untimely born, years later he appealed to me, called me as an apostle. They testified, they were witnesses of his resurrection and people believed through them. We are witnesses of his resurrection because we have participated in it. We live in his resurrection. We noticed a couple of weeks ago that not only were they trying to put Jesus to death, they were trying to kill Lazarus because so many people were believing in Jesus because of Lazarus, because of somebody who was dead and who lived again. We were dead. And we live again. And God wants people to believe through us. He wants us to be witnesses of his son's resurrection. In the service on Friday night, we left with sort of a, a sense of sadness and, and gloom because we tried to unite our hearts and our spirit with their hearts and their spirit as that day closed, as the Sabbath began, as the body of Jesus was in a tomb, and this Sabbath begins like none other had ever begun. As Reese shared such disorientation, such confusion, everything had been stood on its head, such grief, such trauma, the things they had witnessed. And yet this morning, we can share in their joy. We sang a couple of verses of In Christ Alone Friday night, but not the ones that go on to resurrection. We, we stopped with Jesus in the tomb. In just a moment, we'll sing that song in its entirety. But it's a song that reminds us of the totality of the core of our faith, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Not with perishable things like silver and gold have we been rescued or redeemed from our feudal way of life inherited by our forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. Therefore, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. He stands because we live. We stand with him because we live. And if you haven't claimed that gift, if you haven't shared in that love, if you haven't experienced that salvation, listen to Cadence. Give your assent to, to her confession. Submit yourself as she did. Have your sins washed away as hers were and rise to walk in newness of life. And when Peter and John got the news, they couldn't bear to walk. We talked about that in class. They left where they were, and I can imagine a bit of a slow walk and then a fast walk, and one or the other begins to try. And then both of them break out into a run. That's how we go to Jesus. 
we run to him and we fall at his feet. If you need to do that this morning, please make that known as our shepherds are here at the front to receive you or whatever need you may have with which we can minister to you this morning. Let's stand and be singing together.